Hey, this is Ryan Burns Writes, and I'm Ryan Burns. Great Smoky Mountains National Park is the most visited park in the United States. Every year, millions come to enjoy the idyllic mountains of eastern Tennessee, as well as tourist traps like Dollywood. But there's more to this region than just tourism. Yes, it's the home of Dolly Parton, but its dramatic past inspired some of the most influential folk songs in history. Today, I got the chance to chat with Janet Beard, an internationally best-selling author who calls this region home. In her latest book, The Ballad of Laurel Springs, she offers us a saga of several generations of women who lived in this region, whose stories are linked together by Appalachian folk songs. Thank you for joining today, Janet. It's so great to chat. Oh, thank you for having me. Yeah. Could you start off by giving us a summary of the Ballad of Laurel Springs and tell us how it came to be? Sure. So um, the book follows eight generations of women in one family in uh, East Tennessee, near where I grew up in the Smoky Mountains. It's a kind of fictionalized version of um, Gatlinburg and Pigeon Forge. If anyone's ever been to Dollywood, you'll be familiar with the area. So it, it starts off, um, the earliest chapters of the book are in the 1880s, 1890s, when uh, it's a completely rural farming community, but by the present time, it's become a booming tourist town. So, so part of what the book is about is the transformation of the place, but um, each chapter focuses on a different woman going through the generations, and each chapter is also inspired by a different Appalachian folk song. So you kind of see how... Um, not just how, how how the songs are passed through the generations and how the women sort of use the stories and the songs to to pass along information and and lessons or sometimes not how they how they keep their secrets and how that reverberates through time wow that is a part of the country that i love i remember when i was in high school i spent a lot of time going down to that area in the summers yeah. um in the book, there are a few missionaries that go down to set up a settlement school. Mm -hmm. And I'll be honest, when I was in high school, I went on a few mission trips to that part of the country. Mm -hmm. We went to that area next to Gatlinburg and Smoky Mountain National Park. And um, that is a, a theme of the book that kind of struck me because I'll look back on those mission trips and I always felt a little uneasy about it because it's almost like you're kind of saying that that part of the country is like not able to like take care of themselves. And it feels yeah. a little insulting in the book. There's a scene where the, the settlements built and the people there are asking like, wait, why are they coming here? Like we can take care of ourselves. And it kind of hurts their pride a little. Um, I feel like that's a theme that is very prevalent in that part of the country. So do you want to talk about that more and yeah, what you sure. to feel that way? Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I think that's, um, I think all of that's exactly right. I think it's um, all throughout the history of Appalachia. I think obviously it's it has a long history of poverty, which has plagued the region for years. And there's a lot of reasons for that. A lot of it has to do with the kind of extractive industries that are associated with Appalachia, particularly coal mining, although that's not, there's not really any coal mining in this particular book, but also what affected the area I'm writing about more was logging. That was the big industry that um, kind of decimated the natural environment where this book takes place in the early 20th century when they just cut down every tree they could find and took them out. So, so that was kind of the pattern. It's like you go in, you take out the natural resources, the coal or the trees. And for a while, there's sort of not great jobs <laughs> cutting down trees or going to coal mines that people can do. And then the industries leave and take the resources and the people are left behind and, and you know, it creates these cycles of poverty. So, you know, that's not great. And obviously that's created another long history of people from outside, I think, wanting to come in and, and help the people, which, you know, I, I think people have the noblest of intentions and and do great works. So that school in that chapter is actually based on my elementary school where I went to school, which is still there now, you know, just a normal public school, but it was founded by um, a group of young women who, who were coming into the area and, and trying to help people. And, you know, I think that's wonderful, but there is always, I think, 
when people come from outside to help a community, there's always conflict. Um, you know, it can be done well and people, you know, there are ways to do it well. And I think there is a growing awareness now when, when people, you know, try to do that sort of thing about respecting respecting the the native people so to speak from that area um but but yeah I, i'm really interested in that conflict and not just like that's one particular example there's a later chapter you know where there's like hippies coming in and starting a commune and again it's, it's a little different but i it's that same kind of thing it's like the outsider versus the really insular tight community um and you know it's like in a way i don't think there's anyone who's wrong or right in those situations it's very like, like things can be handled badly and they can be handled well but there's just these natural conflicts i think that arise and i'm uh you know i'm sympathetic to, to both sides really because you can see how people are trying to help and you can also see how that can be hurtful even though they have the best intentions and you know it's it's just a tricky thing like getting it right so yeah i think you handle that well in the book um Sounds like the characters all have different views and they all voice the different pros and cons of the situation. Um, and it doesn't feel like the author has a like a theme that they're trying to drive through. It's just showing what happens and showing how all the different characters react to it, um, which I, I like that in writing a lot. Yeah. And uh, yeah, the Appalachia also has so much to offer the country in terms of their They've contributed so much culturally to the country and particularly their music, which is a huge theme of this book, or folk music. Personally, I really love folk music and Appalachian folk mu music um, is the root of so many different styles like blues and country and rock and roll. It all kind of comes from, from that, that combination of Irish and African music that kind of started in the valleys over there. And... Um, it, it was also used as protest music by a lot of the the coal miners who were on strike throughout history, um, all derives from that. Um, I, oh, I love Bob Dylan. He's from Minnesota, so that's not really the same part of the country, but I feel like it's the same kind of style. I, I really like yeah, that. Yeah, I mean, he was yeah. absolutely inspired by some yeah. of his music, yeah. Yeah. Can you tell me about your relationship with Appalachian folk music and how it motivated you through this book? Yeah, so I did, I did grow up in the place where I'm writing about in this one. Um, and I was lucky that, you know, that there I did grow up hearing this music, it was just part of the culture, so to speak, you know, I, um, and so, so yeah, so my mom sang some of these uh, old folk songs that her mother had sung. So I, I literally kind of got that experience of hearing the songs get passed down. Um, and, you know, just at various kind of community events, people would have fiddles or banjos and play the old kind of music. And yeah, I just always loved it. And I loved the old ballads in particular because of the way they told stories. And, you know, there's a particular focus in the book on these um, so-called murder ballads that tell the story of a young girl getting murdered, which, again, I just found really fascinating, partly because the, the culture at large was so kind of conservative, you know, it's also definitely the Bible Belt. So it was kind of crazy to me to hear like my grandma, who was very culturally conservative, singing a song about like a woman getting murdered. It's like, what is going on? That was not her usual style, you know? So um, so I found that really interesting. Um, and yeah, the music itself, I mean, I just feel lucky that I got to, to grow up hearing it. Um, and 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 yeah, I just I I love it. I, uh, I I love all kinds of folk music too, just like you. And um and and I I'm just glad that um especially in my lifetime, I think there's been so much kind of kind of a renaissance of of the community playing that music and a real appreciation of it. So so yeah, just great. Yeah, yeah, I I love that music. Um, all right. Do you have a favorite musician, a uh, contemporary that does bluegrass or that kind of style that you like? Um, oh gosh, it's hard to pick favorite. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> I do. I feel like I have to, of course, um, shout out because we come from the same hometown, the goddess Dolly Parton, who yeah. <laughs> uh, has obviously she 
made most of her career doing more mainstream country, but in the early, yeah. like around the, the turn of the century, in the early 2000s, she did went back and did a few kind of more bluegrass albums where she sings a lot of these older songs. Um, and, and some of the work she did earlier than that with like um, Amy Lou Harris, who's another another Appalachian singing goddess. <laughs> uh, and um, uh, and uh, Linda Ronstadt, they did some albums where they did some of this old folk music. So of course, Dolly, Dolly, Dolly. And she's talked about, um, you know, being inspired by these same songs and growing up hearing them. Um, and of course, she was a huge influence on me growing up, not just because of her music, but because I did, when I was a kid, um, Dollywood opened and it was like the major economic driver of the community where I was growing up. So, you know, Dolly's just this huge thing. I did not make her an actual character in the book because I feel like she is so like, like truth is better than fiction kind of thing. Like I couldn't improve on Dolly in any way. So I just let that be. But um, so yes, um, from like, I, I feel like I've got favorites from different eras kind of like I love um, from the there's a lot of great artists from the 1960s folk revival era, like that Bob Dylan era. Um, Hetty West is one of my favorite from from that time. She played the banjo and um, and just had this amazing banjo style and, and sang the ballads. And, and so I love if, if you're like looking for older recordings of some of the Appalachian folk music. I love Hetty West. There's like the, the classic kind of bluegrass people like Bill Monroe and um, Earl Scruggs. I mean, there's so many that you can just get amazing recordings of all these songs. And I can plug my um, my own Spotify playlist I made to go with the book, which you can find on my website, JanetBeard.com, um, and, or just go to Spotify and search for the Ballad of Laurel Spring Springs. So I got, that was a really fun exercise to kind of put all my favorite versions of the songs. But again, it's so hard to pick favorites because there's like, eight songs in the book and I had to have about five recordings of each one because there's so many good ones. So another part of the book that played a huge role was the Great Smoky Mountain National Park. Yeah. I love going there. Um, I have a lot of memories of going down there in the summers. Um, my fiance has a story about how she was there and her family walked right into a bear. Oh, wow. <laughs> it was pretty, it was pretty scary pretty intense yeah <laughs> and uh but yeah it's so it's so scenic and I always remember going there the park is scattered with all of these abandoned ghost towns where yeah. I guess miners used to live other families used to live and I always wondered what happened to them book kind of answers that question you want to go into that a little more yeah so um the the creation of the Smoky Mountains the Great Smoky Mountains National Park was a little different from a lot of the national parks out west where there weren't very many people living um because they you know they're like, like the grand canyon obviously it's hard to build a house in <laughs> um and a lot of those parks were kind of built you know as you know yeah you understand it's like different it, yeah. obviously there were native people being displaced and that's a whole other story but um but with the Smokies, it wasn't created until the 1930s. And um, similarly, Shenandoah National Park has a very similar story in Virginia. They were both populated areas. They It, it was not isolated wilderness. There were a lot of people settled there who had been there for generations. And um, and the government <clears throat> used like um, imminent domain laws to, to buy up their property from them. And and build these national parks, which um, again, it's sort of like with the settlement schools. I, I think it's wonderful that we have national parks. I'm like the biggest fan of national parks. I I grew up, well, I, I mean, I grew up like literally my, my elementary school, like the settlement school that I was talking about is, you know, a mile from the park. So it was right there. And my dad um, worked for the, he was a teacher during the school year, but he worked for the park in the summer. So I, I literally got to spend my summers with him, like in the national park every day, which was just a dream. And I'm so happy for that. And um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm completely glad we have the national parks. However, there was a cost. There were lots of people who were displaced. Um, and, uh, and, you know, choices had to be made about who would be displaced and how, and that's always complicated. And there was a lot of that in East Tennessee. There, there were also, during that same era, during the 1930s, um, there were lots of dams being built as part of like 
uh, the, the Tennessee Valley Authority um, project to electrify the Southeast. And um, so, so people, the whole, the whole region was really getting hit hard by the federal government coming in and, and basically saying you have to move or flooding your community or we're turning it into a national park. And then a little bit later, um, the, my, my previous book, The Atomic City Girls is about the establishment of the um, laboratories to enrich uranium for the uh, atomic bomb in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. So again, same thing, the government coming through and, and saying, in an even more extreme case then because they were on wartime footing and trying to move very fast like you've got a week to move and <laughs> we're taking your property to turn it into a, a mysterious plant and you will not know what's going on there so so yeah it created a lot of bitterness towards the government I think quite frankly that still exists in that region part of that has really substantial roots in the fact that within you know within memory with people's can remember their grandparents getting displaced and that's a traumatic thing that lingers so so yeah i'm all to say you know i'm glad we have electricity and i'm glad we have national parks but you know these things are complicated and there's winners and losers and you mentioned your first book atomic city girls that came out in 2018 and i remember i actually remember seeing that book my sister read that book um we she lives in uh, wisconsin but i remember going to her house and just seeing that book sitting around. And uh, I remember just like reading through it a little. Um, that, that was before I had heard about the Ballad of Rural Springs. And I'm like, oh, well. Um, yeah, yeah. So th that one came out in, yeah. in 2018, like you said. And um, uh, yeah, it it tells the story. Uh, again, it's it's the same region. It's not that far uh, from, from where this book's taking place. But, you know, really different story about World War II and the development of the atomic bomb, but very much from the point of view of kind of similar characters, I'd say to the people in the Battle of Laurel Springs, the sort of like um, everyday people that come to work on the Manhattan Project uh, in, in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. And I, I think it's super important that writers write about their own stories. And I think it's very helpful when a writer is talking about the place that they come from. And I think it, makes it a lot easier for the story to be authentic when you're writing about your own home. Uh, I think that's great. And um, can you tell me a little bit about what your childhood was like growing up there? You said you went to um, the school that used to be a settlement school and that your grandma would always sing folk songs to you. Uh, that sounds real nice. Yeah. <laughs> I'm probably making it sound a this? little yeah. too idyllic because there was also <laughs> a lot of, um, because of where we lived and my, I, I, I shouldn't have gone to that school, but my dad worked there. I mean, what I mean when I say I shouldn't have gone there is that it wasn't where we lived. It was a long drive, but it was because my dad had a job there. He was the guidance counselor. So, oh. um, so every day was driving through Pigeon Forge. So for anyone who's been to Pigeon Forge, whew, that can be a nightmare, especially in October, which is the high season for the, the leaf, leaf peeping, um, in, in East Tennessee. So, um, so there was a lot of sitting in bumper to bumper traffic. And I, I literally learned to read from reading like billboards and signs, like see live bears, mini golf, <laughs> like, you know, crazy tourist attraction. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, there was that side of it too. But um, I, I, and I should say that the more ballad singing grandma was actually in Southwest Virginia, which is where my mom is from. So there was a little back and forth there, but still very much Appalachia, just a, a slightly different region, more the Blue Ridge Mountains. Um, so so yeah, it was it was a really beautiful place to grow up, and I I, I appreciate that so much because um, I did uh, uh, live out in the country um, where where my dad still lives, which is very much it's the end of a, a holler, as we say, yeah. <laughs> uh, with beautiful scenery all around and uh and he did work in summers in the national park which was a great and he also just loved hiking and I grew up very much hiking in the national park as a, on a regular basis so uh, that appreciation of the natural world was one of the best things about about growing up there I think too and I think also but that kind of goes hand in hand with the sitting in traffic every day and seeing so much development happen because 
uh, Pigeon Forge was already, like I say, Dollywood open. There had been an amusement park where Dollywood was, and it became Dollywood when I was about like eight or so. I think I was a oh. kid, and um, it was already a very booming tourist town, but it exploded during my childhood and youth. And so, kind of seeing just massive development on a really like kind of insane scale. And, and it was in such a beautiful place. Like it, it sort of broke my heart. Like <laughs> I think it it definitely gave me this streak of like really believing in conservation and environmentalism because I could just see the natural world yeah. being decimated constantly. Um, but again, it, like everything else, it's so complicated because that was um, creating a lot of economic opportunity and all of that. So. Yeah, I, I that's just how I see things. I guess it's never never too black and white. <laughs> yeah. Well, we've learned from the book that it can come back because back in the nineteen thirties, uh, before the park was there, it was all just like tree stumps that had yeah. been logged, and so it is possible for it to come back. So yeah, absolutely, so cool. that was one of the big um like impetuses for building the national parks um people who loved the mountains were so horrified by what they had seen and yeah it when you look at pictures from that era it's just crazy like there were just no hardwood trees and it's real there's only like there's special places in the park where there are very old hardwood trees but it, it's most of the trees in the national park are like you know less than 100 years old because of the logging which is again a sort of unusual thing about the national park but yeah it's amazing to watch it how it has come back and you know these things happen in cycles because when i was growing up there was a, a terrible blight going on on the hemlock trees so i was used to growing up and hiking and seeing like these huge groves of what had been hemlock trees that were just dead and like these bald spots on the mountains and now you know things just change the ecosystem refigures itself and i think we're going going through a period of I mean, that's just going to be happening on a massive scale all over the world because of climate change as certain things yeah. die because they can't live in their environment anymore and then new things come up. So, um, so yeah, I, I think that it's sad, it's depressing to look back at those logging photos, but there is something sort of hopeful too about the idea that regrowth and, and things coming in to fill in the gaps and all of that. This has been Janet Beard best-selling author of The Ballad of Laurel Springs from Simon & Schuster. It can be bought wherever books are sold. Thanks for chatting, Janet. Thank you. Again, I'm Ryan Burns, author of the novels Royal Beauty Bright and My Dear Antonio. And remember to keep reading. <laughs>